launching America's Entrepreneur. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Aaron Spatz, and each week we interview entrepreneurs, industry experts, and other high achievers as they detail their personal and professional journeys. Before we jump in, hit the subscribe button and be sure to hit the bell icon so you're notified every time we release a new episode. Friends, welcome to America's Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining for yet another fun and exciting conversation. So we're going to dive right into it. Can't wait to welcome a friend of mine, Christian Espinosa, to the show. Christian has got quite the background, quite the experience. And I can't wait to dive into this and unpack a little bit of this uh, of, of his story. And so Christian is a U.S. Air Force veteran, served uh, you know several years in our, in our in our nation's military before jumping out and really from the time he was in the air force onward he's i mean he's been involved in it cybersecurity, uh, which ultimately led him to form his own firm uh, alpine security which he uh, subsequently sold uh, fairly recently to Cerberus sentinel and so we're going to get to talk with him about that whole experience about founding and starting your own cybersecurity business what does that look like when you go to sell and all the, I'm sure, all the associate drama and uh, fun times and challenges associated with that. Uh, but then also, I, I I would be remiss if I didn't at least shout out his book. He has a book out uh, called The Smartest Person in the Room. And as we were talking about this offline, really excited about this because this is a common misconception that I think that a lot of folks have about folks that work in, in IT related to personality soft skills and so on so i'm gonna let him do all the talking so christian welcome to the show man thanks so much hey thanks aaron i'm happy to be here awesome awesome so i mean you've been in the it and cyber world for for quite some time so one i i can't imagine the evolution of of things that you've seen just i mean there's that but then going through your own journey i think what i where maybe it would make the most sense to start or you know you can correct me also if, if there's other things you want to talk about but like what what led you to wanting to start your own firm i was doing freelance work i was doing it for about i don't know five years maybe six and i started getting bored with the freelance work it i was making like a lot of money and the work became easy. I was traveling wherever I wanted to or working like six months a year, but I felt like I wasn't growing that it became kind of status quo and I wasn't contributing to society the level I wanted to. So that was like the impetus to form my own company uh, was to force myself to grow, to hire people in my company and, and provide opportunities for people and to contribute in a way to society. And also a lot of the challenges I saw in cybersecurity weren't being addressed. So I wanted to do things differently and, and challenge the status quo as well. Yeah, that that's a that's an interesting answer because it's not that it's you're basically saying, like, man, I was I feel like I'm getting stale, not mm -hmm. doing a whole lot with my talents. There's so much more that I can do, so much more I can contribute. And Really, and and I, that's another thing I know about you, right? You've 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 completed you know Ironman triathlons, right? Like you've done, you're mm -hmm. you're active in that space. So, I I can I can see that in you. Like you just you want to continue to push yourself. You want to continue to like work harder, achieve greater things. And so, like where where does that drive come from? Like where like where is, is there an origin story to that? I not sure if there's a really an origin story. I grew up I. Grew up in like a very poor uh, and a chaotic environment with a, a, a drug addicted mother that eventually OD'd. Uh, so that you know gave me some resilience and drive and persistence and motivation to get out of that scenario. And maybe that's something that stuck with me. Uh, the other thing is I, as I mentioned before, I, I don't like the status quo, uh, especially with myself. So if I find myself getting stagnant or doing the same thing. And I feel like I'm not growing. And at this point in my career and at my age, I, I'm not chasing significance through achievements or um, accolades anymore. I'm, I'm more pursuing how I can contribute back to society and how I can add value to, to people and uh, to society in general. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where I am. And, and I think, from a desire to grow, I think that comes along with contribution. It's hard to contribute if you're not growing yourself. That's true. Yeah. Wow. 
Well, I mean, that, that's really something else. I mean, that's, that's a that's that's quite the story, quite the quite the motivator behind kind of why you do what you do. And so, I mean, jumping into your your business, I mean, so you'd started Alpine Security after having a you know quite a you know quite a long and you know successful journey to that point, right? So, mm-hmm. what was that like? What like what was it like just starting something from the ground up and you're like, you know what, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a shot at this. I'm going to get something going. I'm going to bring in more people. We're going to you know, expand our service offerings. Like what, what was that journey like for you in terms of just your own growth and, and, and just, just challenging yourself? It was the most difficult thing I've done. I, I, I tend to, to, to be a doer and not a talker. So I, I, I would take action often without having a concrete plan. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I did with Alpine security. I, I started the company. I thought, you know what, I've got contacts, I've got expertise. I know people, I can just figure it out. And that's ultimately what I had to do a lot of figuring things out. Uh, <laughs> And I invested all my money into the company as well. So wow. I, there was a, a driving factor of necessity there. I, like if I didn't figure it out, I would lose potentially, you know, my house and my car and everything. So I had to figure things out. And it was a lot more, way more challenging than I, th- I thought it'd be. A lot of people think you start a business to just have all this money and free time. Uh, and I started a business that I had little money. And no free time. You know, I went from working. The, the joke people always say is like, it, when you're an employee, you work nine to five. But when you have your own business, you work five to nine. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like that. Yeah. And um, it was forced growth, though, and that's kind of what I was seeking was that forced growth because when you're confronted constantly with new challenges, and you're the CEO and the owner, and you're the only investor in the business, you have to figure them out. And it's not a comfortable way to figure things out because some some situations like my back was against the wall and I had, just had to figure it out or I would lose everything. And there were days that, you know, I'd be like in the fetal position on the floor, kind of crying, thinking, what am I going to do here? You know, if I don't get money coming in, I'm going to not be able to pay my staff or run payroll yeah. properly, you know? So it's, yeah. it's very stressful, but it's also uh, a journey that I, I wouldn't uh, take back for anything, really. It's yeah. very... Uh, it forced me to transform and grow. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, in that story is what I'm hearing is like, you were, there's a lot of things that you're learning, you're growing during that time, but then, you know, struggling, it sounds like to get sales or sales to the point where it exceed, <laughs> exceeds your costs. And so like, what was, what was the turning point for you though, in that, like, what, what do you feel like broke things open for you what was like what was that moment the there were there were a few turning points I, one of the main ones was that i had to realize I, i'm not good i wasn't good with certain things i don't like structure i don't like process i can certainly follow it and there's i see the value in it but i'm not i get bored easily like i said with status quo and everything so i, I i'm not good with those things so what i did is I hired somebody or there was somebody internally, I, I put them in, in the position of a COO responsible for their operations. So I could focus more on the vision and sales and yep. marketing and things that I felt I was better at than the day-to-day running and in, in, in efficiencies of the operation. And once I realized that even though I can do everything, there's certain things I'm better at and certain things somebody else is better at and put the right people in the right seats, uh, like the COO that really freed me up to work on sales, for instance, which uh, a company is not going to exist without sales. And, yeah. and a lot of people don't understand that. Even my engineers didn't understand like why we had to have sales, which doesn't make sense to me. It's kind of mind boggling. Uh, but when I focused on that sales and then also marketing, which when I first started my company, I, I thought, I didn't know anything about marketing. I thought, what is the point, right? And I didn't really know anything about sales. Uh, but those, when I concentrated on those two things and really narrowing down our niche and really speaking the right message and putting somebody else in charge of running operations, that's when things sort of uh, started picking up and improving quite a bit. 
Wow. So you are more of the sales and marketing guy and less of like the day to day operations, you know, internal, you know, product, things like that. Like you're, you're more of like, get me out in front of people. And that's like, that's where the magic happens. So I, and I've talked to people that are like in the opposite situation where they're more comfortable, you know, away from people, but yet they need to grow sales. And so like, I think one of the mm -hmm. takeaways here is just kind of exactly what you said was understanding wh where, where your strengths are, what, like, what are you really good at? What do you naturally gravitate towards and then get other people to help you in the areas that you're not as good. Right. Am I saying that right? Yeah. And letting go, I mean, letting go of those things that you know you can do, but it's probably better if somebody else does it. So you can spend more focus and energy on something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So like, what was for you? I'm just curious, like how, like, what was your main method of getting sales? Like what, what, what was that discipline for you? Like in terms of just getting more deals closed? It was a combination of focusing on sales, but really um, marketing primarily. Okay. And what worked for me was narrowing down the niche. Uh, cybersecurity is a very crowded space. Uh, we did penetration testing as one service, which is ethical hacking. And penetration testing is a very crowded space. So the niche that I thought was not as crowded was like medical device cybersecurity assessments and penetration testing. So I focused on that niche, that market, uh, wrote blogs on that topic, the interviews on that topic. So we got some search engine optimization or SEO, and we developed specialty in that topic, expertise in that specific medical device um, niche, basically. And once we did that, uh, leads started coming in. Uh, so it was wow. no longer us chasing people it was leads were coming in specifically uh, for medical device penetration testing and cybersecurity assessments because I specifically niched it down so much that if you search for medical device cyber cybersecurity assessments, we would pop up as number one or two in Google. Wow. And that that specific focus uh, really got us a lot of business. And then because of that, we got business and other types of penetration testing, and other services as well. But I think a lot of people try to go too broad and then you end up not getting any business because you're trying to serve everyone versus uh, solving an individual segment's problem that uh, they're searching for an answer specifically. And that's yeah. what worked for, for us. Man, that's gold. And I can painfully uh, connect with that point. Exactly. It's like when you go so broad, I mean, I have personal experience in that going too broad that you feel like you really have no use to anybody mm -hmm. and by, and it's scary, right? I think, and I think that's one of the things is like, it can be scary to really, I mean, going, I mean, super narrow focus, right? I mean, you're going after a really, really niche market, but what I've seen other people do, and I, I would love your feedback to this, feel free to agree or disagree. But what I've seen people do is they will go in, they'll focus in on that niche. They will master it. They'll develop, you know, they'll, they'll prove it out. They'll prove that they can do it. They'll prove that they can just own it really well. And then what they'll do then is over time, then they will slowly open up their left and right limits and start to, you know, maybe absorb or, or dip their toe into markets that are starting to touch it. Right. And so it's, mm -hmm. they can slowly expand, but it's because they did their one thing really, really well. Like, What's your thoughts on that? I agree 100%. And that's one of the mistakes I, I made initially with my company. I thought uh, everybody needs cybersecurity. So I tried to uh, market to everybody, which effectively marketed to nobody. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of you know dumb tax I had to pay, as they like to say. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it is scary to niche down because you think, well, I'm excluding all these people. Right. But it, but it exactly. works because... You're, you're solving and you're speaking to a specific audience's need and you're solving a problem that they're looking looking to be solved. Uh, and, and it is scary, but it, it absolutely works. And we even did this with our training. Uh, we did cybersecurity training. And I didn't like students that came to our class that just wanted to pass a test that, that I like to call them paper tigers. They, they just want to check a box and then they get a job and they don't really contribute. Yeah. So... 
I changed our messaging around the classes to, to basically say, if you know, if that's you, you're not for us. So I was like repelling the people that we didn't want uh, in the classes, which actually made more people that we aligned with want to sign up for the classes. So it right. seems counterintuitive, but yeah, it works. That's super cool. Yeah. Well, and then it could, well, and then it creates like this exclusivity thing is like, Ooh, mm -hmm. like they're turning people away. Like, let me see if I got what it takes. Right. Like, and, <laughs> and so it's like this whole, no, I mean, it's, it's genius. Even if it was accidentally genius, Christian, it was genius. So that was a good, <laughs> that was a great move. But, um, so, but yeah, but I mean, so you're going back to like, as you were doing the research, yeah, that, that was a question I had was how did you, land on medical device penetration penetration testing and in just general cybersecurity topics because there's a million and one places that you could have gone right like why why that one what for you about that made you feel like okay there's a big enough like total addressable market here that that is something i can sink my teeth into i think we've got the the basic skill set to go attack that like what like what was going off in your mind that made you decide that versus, I mean, I, I don't know, like, um, like industrial IOT devices, like mm -hmm. what, what, like what, what, what made you go that way? A few reasons. One of them is we, we got a contract for a medical device manufacturer. So we got experience in that particular area. And through that one contract that we got, uh, which is very difficult to get, uh, a lot of things came to light. Uh, one of them was the FDA requirements and, and mandates for medical device manufacturers. Unfortunately, in cybersecurity, uh, if there's not a compliance driver, a lot of people ignore uh, cybersecurity altogether. So one of the reasons was there was that compliance driver. So every medical device manufacturer had to have this assessment. So that's always good when you have something uh, forced upon somebody and they have to find a vendor to do it. Yeah, sure. The other reason is uh, it, it's something that I could get behind. Uh, I think, you know, protecting your credit card information is uh, important, you know, and maybe your, your health information with a medical device though, you're, you're protecting somebody's life and there's all these advances with, with healthcare and with medical technology and I, I don't want those advances to be rolled back because these devices are being hacked. And things like a drug infusion pump, for instance, could be hacked. And if you're on a morphine drip, so and if somebody hacks it remotely, and increases the flow rate, it could kill somebody. Jeez. So there's the, the 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 impact to patient safety that I that I think makes it more tangible, more real. At least it does for me. Like if my grandmother or loved one is in the hospital, I would hate for their, one of their devices, there's an average of 14 devices connected to a patient in a, in a, in a, in a hospital bed. Uh, I would hate for one of those devices to be either intentionally compromised or somehow accidentally compromised and it cause a complication with my loved one's uh, care in the hospital and they die or have some issue because of it. Yeah. So yeah, th th those are, those are the main reasons. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, cause you're now you're getting behind a real cause and like you're, you're, I mean, I mean, I say this as smoothly, but like there, there's an emotional attachment behind that. Like there's a mm -hmm. real consequence. There's something that you can really rally behind. And so for you, that just made the most sense that spoke to you, that stood out to you. So for the, for the medical device, um, contract that you got, was that, was that before you made your focus in medical or was that when you were trying to sell to everybody? That was right when I realized the importance of of, of niching down. Okay. And we happened to get that contract, which solidified uh, that this is a market we should go in into into and the market we should focus on. Got it. Okay. Plus, we had the experience at that point uh, to to back up uh, our sales effort and our marketing effort. Got it. Okay. So you were, at that point, you were still marketing and and looking to serve a very broad market this is one of those that you happen to win but it kind of it kind of confirmed some of your own thinking and your assumptions and mm -hmm. you're like hey this is a great great opportunity you know what why don't we just triple down or actually burn everything else down and focus on this and so yeah i may be going a little bit too far into the weeds on this but i think other people out there that are that have this exact issue 
in their businesses will really appreciate this is like, okay, so what did you do with what you had then? Like, so you had other clients, no doubt that were across all sorts of different industries. You continue to serve them or do you solely off ramp them? Like, what did that look like? Uh, we continue to serve them. Uh, if we got requests for things that were outside of uh, a capability we had developed, uh, we started turning those down. And, and that, that, that's a scary thing too, uh, because as a small business, you need revenue. Yeah. So you want to like, you don't want to turn down a gig. Um, but at the same point in time, you know, if you don't turn down the gig and your resources are tied up working on one gig, that's not necessarily your sweet spot. And then what always happens is something in your sweet spot comes in at the same time and you're kind of like torn. Uh, so that was, that was a challenge for me because I, I didn't want to turn anything down and I, I didn't turn a lot of things down at the beginning, but as we matured uh, and things weren't in our you know, area that we were competent in or area that we defined as our swim lane, yeah. we started turning down that work. Um, yeah. And then cool. in the cybersecurity, a lot of this stuff is very similar. So if somebody wanted a, a web application penetration test, uh, that's really like a subcomponent of a, of a lot of medical device testing. So we would do that and just try to leverage the experience we got through the medical devices and, and vice versa as well. Gotcha. Okay. No, that makes sense. I love the visual that you just, you know, with uh, swimming in your lane. Like I, you know, I quit everything to shooting and stuff. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. like <laughs> you know, your, your, your lane on the range, but swimming is a lot more. That's a, there's a lot more contrast there to look at. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, no, that, that, that really helps. And I think it's, it, this is a great, great, great example of just why it's so important to niche down to get focused and I mean, would, I mean, would you still say Christian, even, even if it means that it's going to make things even harder for you initially, like, because there's people out there, right? I mean, and, and, and I've been there where it's like, you need every available dollar. It doesn't yeah. matter where it comes from. Yeah. And so how do you make that leap or like, at what point, like, what, what are you doing to make that practical? Like, like, how do you make that happen? Well, ideally, you start off that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and I didn't start off that That's way, which, which compounded the issue because yeah, I did need every dollar. And I did take a lot of gigs that were, uh, we had to figure things out as we were doing the work. You know, it was, yeah. it was, it was a stretch. Yeah, but I was like, sure. you know, if I'm looking at this client for $40,000 and I've got uh, to make payroll in the next two payrolls, and I, I don't have any other income coming in. I did take some of those gigs. And then later sure. on, I, I had to just, once I had a mature sales and marketing effort, I could double down on sales okay. uh, and target specific markets to try to get leads uh, that I wasn't able to get before. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Like, uh, and, I, and I know we spent a lot of time there, but that's, I feel like that's one of those fundamental foundational startup practices that gets a lot of people sideways mm -hmm. and maybe it just resonates with me specifically <laughs> but i know but i know but i know there's a lot of folks that have struggled there because it's it, like again you go for you, you're going from the like the self-employed route to now you're trying to become a business owner and there's a there's another set of disciplines that you're trying to develop along the way and so mm -hmm. i just I, I appreciate you just opening up on that and sharing with that sharing that with me so let's fast forward then through through alpine so i mean i'm i'm just looking at it on linkedin here so it uh, looks like you were you're running running the show six years and then you you got acquired so what did that look like did you were you were you thinking about selling at like back on like year one right did you have the end goal is i guess the question i'm trying to ask did you start with the end goal being you want to sell a company or was it simply like, hey, I'm just having fun. I'm I'm challenging the status quo, and then along comes this opportunity. Like, I I made I made all the mistakes when I started my company that you you want to avoid. I did not start the company with an end goal. Uh, I just jumped right in and built and started building it. Uh, so I didn't have a plan to sell it or a plan to grow it to X amount. I just wanted to consistently grow it. And through that journey, I, I, I realized that the things that started sustaining us were the processes and uh, the, the, the 
measurements, you know, the key performance indicators and, and things that were necessary to be acquired, I just naturally started putting those things in place because when you get to a certain point, uh, if you're not measuring what you're doing or you're not, you don't have processes and, and procedures and you hire somebody, then, you know, it takes a lot of effort to get them trained up. So yeah. I, I naturally went through that progression. And then I started getting offers uh, like every couple of weeks I would get an email or a phone call and offer to buy uh, the company. And I, I started, I thought at first I just ignored them all, but then I started talking to people and kind of get a sense of what these offers are like, what people are looking for, what it would be like to leave the company or to exit. And I got to a point where, you know, I was getting burned out basically okay. yeah. uh, of running the company. And I, I was at the point where in order to grow, to get to the next level, I needed an infusion of capital. So I was actually considering getting um, some VC funding uh, or some, or having somebody help infuse some capital in the company and me giving up some of the equity sure. of the company. Uh, Cause I didn't have any more capital myself. I was out of my own funds and it was just too difficult of a, I guess of a challenge to like, you know, hire somebody, uh, then try to get some more revenue and more profit in, then hire somebody else and repeat that process over and over and over. Yeah. Vers when you when you're trying to basically build the company, you know, one person at a time, based on increasing the revenue, and that was burning me out. So I, when I started getting offers later on, I, I started entertaining them, and then the offer that came in from Cerberus um, seemed to align with what I believed in. And I thought there was some synchronicity there for some reason, because uh, at the Air Force Academy, my squadron was called Cerberus, which is a three headed oh, wow. dog. Uh, and then I have a patent. I have like six patents on a device that's called Cerberus. Uh, it's a um, attack simulator for uh, cybersecurity. So I thought, Hmm. There, you know, there's there's some things that are aligned here, and maybe this is like the universe telling me this is the organization to go with, and that's ultimately what I ended up doing. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. If that same name had been used you know, multiple times, or you'd yeah. seen that used, that that's crazy. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's what like, I thought. It's a it's a pretty unique name. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's like I don't. I'm not just gonna like randomly name my dog Cerberus. You know, it's like it's, <laughs> it's one of those things you don't think about, right? So uh, that's that's pretty cool. That's yeah, there's a cool. show I watch uh, on Amazon. It's called Seal Team, and the dog in that show is called Cerberus. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. Well, yeah, let's let's shift gears here. Just in our final final minutes here, Christian, walk me through your book, Smartest Person in the Room. What's the story behind that? Most of the problems I had in my company, my cybersecurity company, were not a result of a lack of technical skills. They were a, a result of a lack of emotional intelligence. And this was internally like with collaboration amongst team members, like somebody would be afraid to bring something up for fear of being ridiculed. It was with clients. Uh, my highly technical engineers would talk over a client's head, not make the client feel understood or appreciated. And I, I realized that these things had to be solved because I didn't want to provide a standard uh, run of the mill cybersecurity uh, technical experience for people. I want to provide a, a great experience overall. Sure. Uh, and what I ended up doing was implementing these different things in my company uh, around emotional intelligence training and communication skills and how to build rapport and how to collaborate. And the things that ended up working are what I wrote about in the book. And oh. once I, solve that challenge in my company, uh, we went from transactions basically with our clients to more long-term relationships. And they, they, they wanted to keep working with us because they enjoyed working with us. People, you know, make decisions on how they feel emotionally, not just, uh, based on price or, yeah. or, or logic typically. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's something else like cataloging your experiences. I mean, that's a great, that's a great way as like, you're going back and just going through lessons learned. And that's a, mm -hmm. that's a great, that's a great place to start. Right. At, now, you, you mentioned it real quick. Now you got me curious. So like revenue model 
for Alpine or was that you mentioned transactional was there a was there a, a recurring revenue model associated with that or was it just strictly like you're paying us to do an assessment and that's basically it yeah so that that was um a challenge uh, I, I there, there's a lot of effort involved to get a client and if you yeah. can't retain that client it ends up basically costing you a long run so our model in was to get a client with a project and wow them with the experience and then get them on an annual contract. Uh, it was it. very rare a client was si would sign for an annual contract without getting to know you, like you, and trust you, right? Sure. So we did a project, and then throughout that project made observations, then did a project close meeting, and mentioned the observations that we noticed in the project that were outside of what the project scope was, and mentioned how we could you know, help them with those observations if they wanted help. And that often resulted in, in a longer term relationship. Oh, that's cool. That, yeah, that's not smart because you're not, especially if you're presenting it as, as an observation, right? You're not going mm -hmm. in and doing like a strong arm sales tactic. You're, you're delivering on what you're told to do and hired to do, but then you're also like, Hey, you're just trying to be helpful. And so that, that comes across like, they're like, Oh, wow. Like I've gotten a chance to know, like, now I know, like, and trust you, mm -hmm. but now you're bringing me something really for my benefit and it and you're delivering it in a way that feels really helpful and genuine and so they're like well well christian you you you, you already know our environment you know what you're you know, what you're up against let's do it you know and that's yeah. yeah yeah that's super cool that's super cool well uh for folks that want to get to know you more want to check out your book again i'm doing this for the benefit of those that are listening not watching but i uh, go to christian espinoza Dot com. You can learn more about Christian there. Um, all sorts of things that you got on the website. It's a great, great looking website, man. And uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks. you can check out the book. You can order the book there. Smart, smartest person in the room. Uh, we, we promoted that earlier. And uh, but yeah, Christian, I just I, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for making some time for me, sharing your story, sharing uh, just some of the lessons learned. This has been this. This has really been awesome. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. It's been a great discussion. Thanks for listening to America's Entrepreneur. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review or comment on your preferred social media platform. Share it out with friends, family, coworkers, others in your network. And of course, you can write me directly at Aaron at boldmedia.us. That's A-A-R-O-N at boldmedia.us. Until next time.